This is Dr. Karen, and you're listening to the DeFacto Leaders Podcast on the Bee Podcast Network, where I help pediatric therapists and educators become better leaders so they can make a bigger impact with their services. With over 15 years of experience supporting school-age kids with diverse learning needs, I'll share up-to-date evidence-based practices, my own experiences, and guest interviews designed to help clinicians, teachers, and aspiring school leaders feel more confident in the way they serve their students and clients. I'll cover a range of topics designed to help you support students' emotional and academic growth and set kids up for success in adulthood, including how to support language, literacy, executive functioning, as well as how to help IEP teams working together to support kids across the day. Whether you want to learn more effective strategies for your therapy sessions or classroom, be a more influential leader on your team, or find creative ways to use your skills to advance in your career, I've got you covered. Hey there, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 145 of the DeFacto Leaders podcast. In this episode, I'm going to share the first part of a two-part conversation with Ben Hakima, a certified financial planner. I decided to break this conversation into two separate episodes because we really did have two separate conversations. In the first part, we talked about how we can teach kids about money. And in the second part, we talked about how we can improve our own financial literacy skills. So this episode is going to be all about how we can support kids. And we start to transition towards the end to talk a little bit about the professional side, but stay tuned for episode 146, where you can listen to the second part of the conversation. So executive functioning and financial literacy go hand in hand, which is why money management should be part of any K-12 curriculum. Much of this has to do with self-evaluation, the ability to think into the future, and the understanding of quantitative and temporal concepts. There are endless digital tools designed to help people manage their finances, but these tools won't be useful for people who don't have a solid sense of the quantity or the value of money and how to know when to use those tools and when they're relevant. So that's why I invited Ben Hakima to episode 145 of the DeFacto Leaders podcast to discuss how we can talk to kids about money and help them develop financial literacy. Ben is a certified financial planner and the founder and advisor of Illuminate Wealth Management. He works with individuals, families, and small business owners on their full financial picture, everything from cash flow and paying for education to saving and investing for big goals such as retirement to individual and small business tax planning so that his clients can gain clarity and develop a path that is unique to their own goals, hopes, and dreams. In this conversation, we discuss how to overcome shame so you can teach kids about money, even if you're not a financial expert or don't think you're good at money management how to have intentional conversations that help kids understand the value of money, how to make money tangible and help kids learn the value behind the numbers and all those digital tools. What skills and abilities should someone have before they get a credit card, especially when you're working with young adults? How can families set up boundaries and expectations in their homes when it comes to responsibilities, chores, and earning money? and how to help kids navigate earning opportunities such as getting money for chores, getting a job, or starting their own side hustle. One of the things that I hope you take away from this conversation is the importance of both building those skills that help kids to develop those quantitative concepts, so some of these things they learn in school, but also giving them the opportunities to apply this knowledge in real life situations. So this includes things that professionals can be doing. It also includes things that families can be doing. So if you're a parent, this is something that you wanna keep in mind for your kids. And if you're a professional working with parents, this is something that you can encourage them to be doing. 
Something else that is important to think about is that not only do kids who struggle with executive functioning have a difficult time with time perception, meaning that if you show them a digital clock, it might be hard for them to sense what those numbers mean. They might have to look at tools that make time feel more tangible, like an analog clock. We want to think about this when we teach kids about money as well, especially when we're thinking about these tools that give you numbers and spreadsheets and all of those things that we use to manage our finances. Remembering that kids have to have a sense of quantity and numbers that they have learned in real life experiences in order for those kinds of things to be helpful and also that kids need to have real life experiences to understand the value behind time and money and how those things go together. Making these things tangible and using manipulatives when we are building these skills. And Ben shares some great ways that you can start those conversations and give kids those experiences in this conversation. And one of the things that we also want to think about is ensuring that we are building those executive functioning skills in the programming that supports kids as they're going through their K-12 experience. And that is exactly what I show you how to do in the School of Clinical Leadership, my program that helps related service providers design services that support executive functioning. You can learn more about the program at drkarendudekbrennan.com backslash clinical leadership. Now, please enjoy the first part of this conversation with Ben Hakima. Today, I am joined by Ben Hakima from Illuminate Wealth Management. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Thanks for having me here. So let's start off with having you just share a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm a certified financial planner, um, started Illuminate Wealth Management uh, right before COVID, January 1st, 2020. Great time to start a business, but yeah. uh, <laughs> we, we focus a lot on, on financial planning. A lot of people hear wealth management uh, and they think either investments or insurance salesmen. And uh, we, although we, we do advise on investments and insurance, it's the whole comprehensive picture. So my youngest clients in their 20s, oldest clients in their 90s, everything about uh, every stage of life, anything related to money, we're working with clients. I worked at another firm for about 15 years before starting uh, right, right at COVID. So yeah. uh, great, great time. And we now have, uh, I've got some people that work for me in multiple states. So we really are nationwide at this point. Was that the plan before you knew COVID was going to happen? Or <laughs> did that like, how did that line up? Like, why did it happen at that time? Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I, you know, planned to, to leave my other firm and start January 1st. Um, and a big reason for it was just kind of work-life balance. You yeah. Know, that's, that's was a big buzzword before and now is even bigger, I think, since mm -hmm. then. And so the plan was to be able to, you know, travel with my family and still be able to work. And so invested a lot into technology to begin with, which meant when the world shut down, I was already a, a little bit ahead of the game compared to most uh, yeah. financial planners, but um, didn't know I was going to have employees, didn't know we were going to have clients in 16, 17 states uh, a couple of years later. So just kind of happened. Uh, so it was yeah. kind of intentional, but a lot of it was not. <laughs> Yeah, well, you never really know. I mean, you can you can plan, but not not too much, you know, exactly. or like you can't always predict everything. There's a I think it's a like a paradox. You you can plan and have your vision, but also know that it there's things that you will have to shift and adjust along the way. Absolutely. Okay, so before I know we wanted to talk about, you know, how do we how do we support kids and help mm -hmm. them think about money? But then also we have a lot of professionals here who are also working on their own portfolio mm -hmm. or just their own career and thinking about money. But I am curious, since you mentioned that you work with people of all different ages, I know there are some people who really want a financial planner who understands what it's like for their generation. You know, they kind of feel like, you know, people who were 
growing up 20 years ago, the, it's just very different. And, the, and mm-hmm. the different generations are dealing with different issues. And so I'm just curious what your experience has been with the different generations, or mm-hmm. if you found that by, like the the age and the experience and the type of clients that financial planners work with, like how does that impact things? Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know that anyone's asked me that question. That's a great yeah. question. So I just, I'm thinking of somebody who was like, I want somebody who understands what it's like for millennials, who is right. a millennial or, right. at, you know, at least has a lot of experience for millennials. So anyways, Absolutely. go ahead. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I, I have found, uh, and I think there's a lot of industry studies that would support this, that most people want an advisor within 10 years of their age um, uh-huh. that typically yeah. has happened. Uh, what was interesting is earlier in my career, I was, I was, you know, I'm in my twenties and I'm starting to meet with clients and saying, why would ever anyone ever hire me? Um, you know, at that point. And then I started to hear, well, now my, I'm approaching retirement and so is my advisor. I now want somebody who's a lot younger than me because I want you to work with me the rest of my life. I, and I'm losing my advisor. And so naturally while you're working, I think a lot of people gravitate towards somebody close to their age. And then when their advisor retires, if they're still working with somebody, they shift to someone who's a couple de- decades younger just to work on that. But with that, I think there are some similarities across just people, right? People are people. Mm-hmm. And one big thing that comes out is um I've got a client, he recently passed away, but he was 97. And between my partner and I, we worked with him for almost 40 years. There were things that he would talk about that happened when he was 10 years old, 16 years old, that still affected him in his 90s. Because there, there's a relationship with money that everybody has, whether you admit it or not. And the way he thinks about money and scarcity and running out of money and all of these things, he had nothing to be worried about that he could live a lot longer than he did and still have money. But just some things that were in his brain during the Great Depression that yeah. were you know stuck that affects you the rest of your life. So there's some foundational things that we all kind of experience, Uh, but kind of getting to your, your question, there is something to be said of what millennials experienced is different than what um, boomers experienced. And so your formative years are going to impact the way you think about money and then what you do with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think my, my response to, to that is always like, I don't, I think that having somebody who has had the same experience as you is one way that they can gain knowledge of what you're going through. It's not the only way, but I get that. I mean, people just want to know that the person supporting them hears them and understands them and is not going to give them outdated advice or with money, just the shame piece. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want somebody who's going to be like, you know, you're spending too much money on lattes right. or whatever, you right. know, like there's, there's a lot of shame marketing with uh, money. And so I think that, oh my gosh, I can, I can tell stories of, you know, conversations I've had with people older than me who um, even just with career decisions where it's like, um, I was having a conversation with the person who, you know, was very well-meaning and this is at the beginning of my career. And Um, I had a master's degree and, you know, it was like, we're figuring out where we want to live. And I'm like, well, I have a job here. And like, we're, you know, you're trying to figure out, you know, with your spouse and figure like, where are you going to live? And who's like, how's the commute? And someone said to me, well, why do you need a job? Your husband is working. (laughs) And I was like, I have a master's degree and like advanced training And we don't have any children. Like, why would I not be working? And again, it's just that, I mean, it was a generational thing. You know, it's kind of assumed, well, um, you know, you're going to be, you know, in the home. And, you know, I know that most people wouldn't say that anymore, but just even the the things that you think about in planning your life that are going to Mm -hmm. impact your financial decisions and um, all of the things. So I just, I think of that where it's like, um, and and the a lot of the people I would say that the fields of education and you know the the therapy mental health space speech pathology it does tend to be you know there's a large percentage of them are women with speech pathology I think it's like there's two to three percent are male 
it, you know, times have changed, but I do know that there are people who are in the field where it's kind of like, um, depending on how old they are, it's like, well, your career and your income, it's a supplemental income. You're not the breadwinner. Right. Your career is second to your, your husband's. Like, I know that some people got that messaging of like, just get married and have a man take care of you. And Thankfully, I don't think people are getting that advice anymore, but I understand how people would not want someone who has that ingrained in their in their mind when they're trying to give financial advice. So absolutely. I, two things jumped to mind as you kind of talk through that. Um, one is just I, I was talking to my brother. He's uh, about 11 years younger than me. And, and so he's earlier in his career and trying to figure out where to go. And I was, he was asking, um, you know, people, my parents age advice on career things. And then as a business owner, I was saying, I don't know that that still applies anymore. Yeah. Uh, that was a great idea, but I don't know that you should approach it that way. And, and maybe, you know, the, the interview process is a little bit different now. And what do you oh, write on your yeah. resume? All those things are just wildly different today than they used to be. And, I think that that just like, you know, whether it's career advice or financial advice, who's saying it matters um, and, uh -huh. and you want somebody who is aware. And so that doesn't mean that an older advisor doesn't know what's going on, but they have a different life yeah. that they've lived. Right. And a, a different situation. Um, the other thing I'll say that I've found that I, I just didn't I didn't realize, at least earlier in my career, how impactful this would be. But at this point, I probably worked with 200, 250 client families. And so I've seen different life experiences from, you know, as a third party, but I've been right. in, in, involved in it. And so, like I said, my youngest clients in their 20s, oldest is in their 90s. There's a lot of experience that just an advisor who's working with a lot of different people, you get that you see things that, you know, maybe it only affects 1% of people, but that's a couple clients that I've had. Yeah. And so I've seen it. And um, that's a, a benefit of working with a third party is just, they see things that you wouldn't ever know to look for. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the objectivity, I mean, it's, that's always very valuable. <laughs> right. I mean, a there's a reason party. My wife and I have had a financial advisor and I tell people that and they say, what, I, I thought you knew what you were doing. Yeah. It's nothing, it has nothing to do with the technical skills. Mm -hmm. It's everything about money. It's a relationship with money. Everyone has blind spots, whether it's a relationship with a person or a relationship with money, you have your own blind spots, especially when I'm trying to navigate that with my wife who has a different experience and different things she cares about. It's really nice to have a third party to lean on and they can, you know, call me out when I'm talking down or to her yeah. about a concept or, um, you know, just to help navigate the relationship so that we can work together on it instead of, you know, maybe combative. Well, yeah. And, you know, I think with, if you do have more of an analytical mindset and you're dealing with things that are so emotional, you can't just be like, here's the spreadsheet. This is what we should do. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it's probably not, even if the spreadsheet matters and you need to bring it in at some point, might not be what you want to lead with when, I mean, even just, I think about people with their, when they're selling their house and how important it is to have a third party to be like, how much is your house really worth? I know you've raised your family and have all the, you know, you have all these memories in this house. So it seems so valuable to you, but it's yeah, <laughs> emotions and money. And, and I think this applies to other fields as well. Like therapists have therapists or coaches have coaches and all of those things. So anyways, um, so talking about um, kind of the first part of, of what we wanted to talk about, I know that we have a lot of people who are in the, uh, I would say a caregiver role in some way. So maybe they are a professional supporting families, um, helping their kids to learn how to make decisions and problem solve and develop some of those skills to plan for the future. Um, we've got people who are teachers, therapists, working directly with students, teaching them those functional skills that they need for life. Um, and then also there probably would be some parents listening who want to know how to talk to their kids about money. And some of the things that come up specifically with, with my audience 
is that there's there's a transition planning piece where it's kids in special education and they need to have certain experiences to prepare them for the workforce or college, um, people with um, things like you know, ADHD, dyslexia, other learning disabilities that impact their executive functioning, which is all about thinking into the future and how do your decisions that you're making today uh, impact what happens in the future and, you know, being able to plan for those things. And I think money, um, you know, even when we think about math skills and like being able to visually see the money and like, where's your money going and credit cards, it's easy to kind of put it out of your mind and not see it. So I would love to know just at a high level, maybe the the principles that you start with when you're working with families, when they're talking to kids about money and just kind of high level how you start. And then maybe we can talk about some specific okay. strategies from there. Absolutely. It's, uh, we could talk for hours, I think, yes. about, about all the specifics. Um, the first thing that I've just noticed with with everybody as they talk to their kids or or students about money is um, is money is emotional and that also applies to the person who's teaching right yeah. and so a lot of people say to me in in their own words I'm really bad with money who am I to Mm -hmm. share this with somebody or, or something else. And so you mentioned shame or, you know, a couple of minutes ago, I think there's a lot of shame marketing and a lot of things that says you're not good enough. You know, there's a perfect way to do it according to the spreadsheet and you need to follow it and whatever else that looks like. And I, I think that actually both for yourself so that you're able to talk about it, but also to express that to, um, to kids that, the entire financial world is really out there to um, get you to take action and not mm -hmm. always in your best interest. And it's really easy to fall into these traps of, um, you know, I'm not good enough, whatever mm -hmm. else you think you should be good with money, but it's not taught in most settings. Parents don't do a great job in general teaching kids about money. And so we're all kind of out here trying to figure it out at the same time together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so just kind of that high level it's okay to make mistakes, uh, but there are some principles, which we'll get to in a second, um, that are just really important to do, but start with kind of get rid of that shame because you need to be able to go and, and kind of do it yourself. Um, when we talk about kind of big principles, one, one thing that I found, especially for older kids and young adults is automation as much as possible, uh, yeah. is really important. Make the, you know, come up with the plan once. And then automate everything else so you limit all mm -hmm. the decisions that need to be made, I think is huge. Um, but as we kind of apply to everybody, you know, money has value. It's easy if you get a dollar and you don't know what it is. Uh, you know, if you're a young kid, a dollar doesn't mean anything to you. Um, but just kind of talking through that money is based on both scarcity and demand and what you're doing, I think is one good um, kind of high level concept. Understand where money comes from is related to that. Why does it have value? It has value because you had to work for it. And mm -hmm. I know that uh, my daughter, so I, I have two kids, my daughter's seven. Um, she loves stuffed animals. She has I don't, she has over a hundred probably. And every, you know, Christmas, birthday, whatever, she always asks for them. Her two favorite stuffed animals are the ones that she worked for to save up her money and then mm -hmm. purchased. And yeah. that has value to her because she worked for it. And that is kind of a, a nice start when we talk about money is you worked for it. That's why it's more meaningful to you. Um, so that's an important one. Money's not unlimited. And uh, just being intentional about how you save first before you spend is really easy. So we can dive into all those a little bit more, but uh, kind of a high level, there's there's a lot there. Yeah, well, and I think what you said about, you know, parents not necessarily, um, you know, doing the right things to talk to kids about money, um, just talking and thinking about why that happens. I would say that there's in the disability space and the parenting space. Um, and this happens with the professionals as well, that the information out there, one, there's a lot of it. And two, a lot of it isn't very good. And I can think about things that would translate over to financial planning 
that have to do with um, some of the things in the parenting groups. Like there's this whole idea of, um, you know, not like, it's almost like the kind of anti-resilience where we want to protect kids from everything. And as a result, we're not allowing them to, to struggle, have these experiences um, and just like giving them so much. And so they don't have that experience of knowing, you know, I earned this, I did work for this um, and just, you know, giving them everything that they want and almost this overindulgence. And so some of that is promoted, you know, it's like, it's kind of trendy now in certain groups. And so it applies to things like just doing chores around the house, how you handle learning and just day-to-day routines and like getting ready in the morning or, you know, doing your homework and so much help and saving kids from discomfort. And I think that when you, you know, translate that over to the financial piece, just the idea of that, like, there's this give and take and this reciprocity, um, things in life aren't just given to you. And so I think that that kind of, I mean, that impacts all of these principles, like in a lot of those things that you said. So just understanding the value of time and money and, you know, what it means, what you had to do to, to get the things that you have or what your parents had to do to be able to provide you with the things that they're giving you. I wanted to take a quick break here and talk about the School of Clinical Leadership. In this part of the conversation, Ben and I are discussing strategies like automation, which can be a really important habit in developing your financial literacy skills. And I've talked before about how students who struggle with executive functioning have a difficult time benefiting from strategies like lists and planners that help them to create plans and schedules and figure out steps to take to execute on homework assignments or to-do lists or things that they need to accomplish in their day-to-day lives. So all of the tools that you might use for financial automation work the same way. All of these things are tools and they are tools that require a significant amount of internal planning in order to use effectively. So when we're thinking about all these automation tools that we can use for managing our money and we are thinking about how we might get kids involved and learn how to use some of these things, we want to remember that tools are not executive functioning strategies. They are things that we use when we're already engaging our executive functioning. It's really important that we teach kids early on to develop problem solving skills, to develop self-awareness, and to understand how to use strategies. And also to build skills like time perception and understanding of quantity. And so we're about to get into that conversation right now. But part of what we can do as related service providers and educators is to ensure that we have instructional programming and services in place that support students' executive functioning, whether this be proactive, all the students in the curriculum, or whether this be students who are eligible for specialized services in the schools. And I show you how to do this in the School of Clinical Leadership. In the School of Clinical Leadership, I help related service providers design services that support executive functioning. So both what you can be doing in your therapy sessions, as well as how you can be training and coaching other professionals or parents that you work with to support kids. To learn more about the program, you can go to drkarendudakbrandon.com backslash clinical leadership. Now let's get back to the conversation. There, there's so much information out there for any, you know, I could look up the opposite of every advice, every piece of advice yeah. I've given and probably find something that's going to say, you know, you should do the opposite of what I recommended to a client. We all, you know, we deal with money every day, right? You, you mm-hmm. go to the grocery store or you, you know, you go to the store, whatever it is, you pay bills, you deal with money every day. So it feels like something we know really, really well, because it's, it's what we see all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, 
if you're if you haven't been intentional, you haven't um, learned the right thing, how to filter out those other pieces, um, it's really easy to kind of get stuck in the mindset of, you know, I should be better at it or whatever else. You just you're not an expert in it. And that's OK. It's OK to admit that um, on it. But um, I, I definitely think the resilient piece, I'd much rather, you know, kids experience some failures with money before they're adults with much bigger dollars <laughs> that are, yes. you know, having the problem. I think those are Biggest, really important higher times. stakes issues too. Like, you know, not getting your stuffed animal versus not being exactly. able to, <laughs> you know, pay your mortgage. Pay rent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A little bit, a little bit different situation. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So here's, here's the thing. And I'm thinking of, of math, you know, um, a lot of times, so for example, eventually you're using a calculator, um, you're plugging things into spreadsheets and you are, you're automating things because you've got the basic skills and the, the foundational knowledge, you know, basic numeracy, an understanding of quantity, like it's in your head, you know, you understand that you be you can look at a number on a page and it can mean something to you. And so you know, eventually you can get to that stage of automation, which is so important for us to be able to do to have good habits as adults. But when when you're talking about kids who don't necessarily have those concepts yet, there's this, it's like there's this pre-stage to get to the automation of what we do, you know, like how in math, you have to do things by hand first to understand the concept. And then you can get to the point where, okay, we've learned this and now we can move on to these more advanced things, which is kind of the same thing with financial planning. So what, when you're talking with families, what are some experiences like, you know, if you've got, you think about elementary school, high school, or young adults who are prepared or, you know, preparing for college or the workforce, like what are some experiences that families can make sure that they give kids to help them to understand those underlying skills that are going to help them develop good habits and automation? Great. Um, the, the number one thing, no matter the age, I think uh, having an open communication about money is, is the beginning, right? So yeah. if you're paying for something, you're, uh, again, you're at the grocery store and with your four-year-old, just talking about, I'm thinking about buying this, but I've just, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to switch to okay. this one because it's a little bit cheaper uh, mm -hmm. or whatever else, you know, I'm, talking about the trade-offs so it becomes something that is normalized and it's not some new concept mm -hmm. when they're 16 or, or whenever it is. So that's just kind of talking about it is first. Um, a yeah. lot of families never talk about money at all. You don't need to tell your five-year-old or even your 18-year-old how much money you make, but having an open conversation about it, I think is important just to, to make it normal. Yeah. Um, you know, talking about... Um, wants versus needs of, mm, mm -hmm. of, I need to pay for this. Um, I want to pay for this. You know, I, I want to go travel. We, uh, it's a big thing in my family where, uh, we like to travel, but we are very clear that that's only happening because we've planned for it. We've saved for it. That's a conversation I have with my elementary school kids is mm -hmm. we have a budget for the year that we have for travel and when it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, that's something we talk about. Um, and I think that can work for, for everybody as you get, you know, uh, teenage years, definitely setting up some rules that every time you, you get some money, you should put it into a couple different buckets. Mm -hmm. So physically taking the money, I think that's important to talk about, yeah. uh, physically having money, not uh, digital. There are some, some good like debit cards that are for kids. Those are nice. Once you've, learn those skills, but you mm -hmm. need to physically see it. You need to take the money yeah. and you have to say, okay, I got $10. I'm going to put $2 into this longer term. And what, what is that for? That's to save, you know, for my daughter to save for buying the stuffed animal down mm -hmm. the road. Yeah. Um, here's some money that goes here. And even, uh, you know, when it gets to tax time, talking about taxes, if you're comfortable sharing your actual, um, you know, tax return with your 16 year old, go for it. But at least talking about here's how it works. Um, that may be something you're not comfortable doing or knowing uh, all the details. But if you have a tax preparer or a financial advisor, they can probably high level talk about it. Yeah. Just to say, here's something that's there. And and just the there's a value of getting a job <laughs> if you yes. can have the job. If you can have the job. And obviously, I know there's a wide range um, 
of listeners here, but there's an importance working at McDonald's is a good way to learn some skills and it understand, is. okay, I have to work for this money. Here's what that means. And then what do you do with it? So it's not mm-hmm. just get a job and now you go spend all the money, but actually putting some standards in place. Okay. Uh, you know, here's something that you can save 20% of it. If uh, Just number one concept. If you save 20% of your income, I know it's really hard. <laughs> if you save 20% of your income, you're going to be fine. Like I'm just mm-hmm. broadly going to say that. So yeah. start with that for everybody. Simple concept. As your income grows, you save more. Everything's going to actually probably work out if you're able to do that. Yeah. Well, and I think with the, so the, the employment thing, there is so many benefits to that just beyond the financial piece, just knowing how to work with people, um, you know, understanding how to manage a schedule but I think I know that there's a lot of people who have aspirations to be, you know, professional football players, professional gamers, influencers. And, you know, I think it's good to have the conversations because a lot of those things are a lot harder to do successfully than people realize. But but also, I think if you want to experiment with things, it's fine. But I do think for many people, even if you do end up building the skills and finding a self-employment option. Cause I know, I mean, I know teenagers do that. Like they'll start a lawn mowing business or, um, you know, do a lemonade stand or something that is more entrepreneurial, which I think is great, but just the, the experience of having a job, even if it might not be what you think you want to do, knowing how to be employed and understanding how it works So that if you do decide to do something else when you're older, you at least have that comparison. You know, I don't, I think that just having the varied experiences for the financial, the interpersonal, all of those things are going to be so important. And I know that um, there's ways you can mimic that at home with chores, which I think is good, but it's different when you have an actual boss that's not your parents. Yes, yes. And and typically I found you know, the boss is going to be a lot better at, at holding you accountable yep. um, mm-hmm. than the parent is. And I, the number of times that I've heard parents talk about, you know, this is the plan I've got and it looks great on paper. And then when you go to execute it after two weeks, it's just not worth the stress and fights and all the things that go into it. Uh, you can, you can have the employer yeah. <laughs> deal with, deal with that. I know. Well, and, and there's a little bit more of a, like, there's more motivation for kids to be, um, they, they behave differently around peers and other adults and mentors in their life than they do to their parents. I mean, it's just, or, or their siblings, obviously. Um, how do you handle things just, you know, if you have a child who is too young to get a job, I mean, how do you think about chores and things like that? So a lot of it comes down to uh, both, you know, the amount of money that the family has. Are you Mm -hmm. able to do some things uh, with it? But uh, and the other is is how how accountable are you going to hold the child to it? That's very important. So I I know just from my experience, there's some parents that they whether they know it or not, they're not going to be able to hold accountable. And so it's probably going to be something where it's less tied to chores or to jobs or things that you do. But um, if there's situations that they're getting money, um, just making sure that they're intentionally doing something with it. It's not just to be take to target to spend. (laughs) Um, So that's one piece. But what I found really that works really well is when you tie um, certain extra chores to pay and mm-hmm. so there there should be some things as being a part of a family that you have to do just because you're part of the family you don't get yep. paid for it mm-hmm. <laughs> but then there could be extra things and so for my for my house it's pulling weeds um we hate pulling weeds all four of us in my house do and it's not part of a typical chore list that we have but if you're going to do it we have a small amount of money that our kids can earn and one of our kids is more likely to do it than the other and that's fine we just then have to only pay one of them yep. <laughs> and when when the younger one complains that she doesn't have any money 
it's because you didn't work. You have the opportunity and not giving in and not buying something just because they're throwing a fit or whatever else. So mm-hmm. um, being consistent, if you're able to do that, I think is great. Tying something to it. Uh, if you're willing to go all the way to say, put put it in three buckets, put it into savings, a spending and, and maybe a giving uh, piece just to think outside yourself. I think that's really important and helpful uh, once they're earning money. Um, I have even debated um, having a tax every time that my kids get paid. I, I'll increase their pay a little bit, but uh, they have to pay to to our family because taxes are a fact of life. There's mm-hmm. no way around it. But I'd rather them learn it at 12 than learn, you know, when they get their first job and they say, what is this FICA nonsense that I have? <laughs> oh, yeah. Or even like I have had um, and this is, you know, obviously people we'll get into this in just you know a few minutes but when you switch from being an employee to self-employed and realizing how taxes work I know some people are like I knew I had to uh, think about this but I didn't realize how much I'd be paying or like right, right. I mean I I've heard you know some stories anyways <laughs> one last thing I wanted to ask about relating to kids before we kind of switch over to to how we can support the adults, um, thinking about credit cards, I have even in some of the, I would say this, this person I'm thinking of does do a little bit of the shame marketing, but he's having a conversation with this person in their early twenties, um, going through their financial plan. And he's like, you are not a credit card person. You cannot, based on what I'm seeing right now, you can't be a credit card person right now. So obviously with credit cards, it's not, you know, for people who have a hard time with that sense of money and like truly deeply understanding what the numbers mean, a credit card is is going to be difficult for them and that you do have to have a certain level of skill and understanding to be able to use a credit card responsibly. So how do you think about integrating that in when you've got, you know, little kids who it's maybe like, here's $5 to go spend at the dollar store. And you've got to think about that versus you've got an an older child who is starting to, you know, maybe they have a job, they're able to be more independent. When does the credit card come in? And what are some prerequisite things that you like to see in really anybody before you recommend that credit cards come into the picture? So I'm I'm going to answer it in a second, but when you said that, it really jumped out, and I want to make this very clear. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, there are there are people out there that say you should open up a credit card in your kid's name to help them build credit. That is a horrible idea. Never do okay. it. <laughs> we go in all the reasons. Oh man, just don't listen to them. I understand what they're trying to say. It is not good so don't do that so okay. with that it said with that <laughs> I didn't said even think of that but people do it more of when you're gonna just give correct them correct because... so we'll go there we'll go there but yeah. i just had to say it before we moved okay. on so I'm glad you did <laughs> there are some people i i think the way you phrase it is great there are some people that are not credit card people they mm-hmm. uh through experience or not um and a lot of people don't know they're not credit card people until they've racked up credit card debt Mm -hmm. and not able to do it. Um, If you're going to use a credit card, no matter the age, there has to be an awareness of what you can afford to spend Mm -hmm. first. And so uh, I talk to a lot of clients about the difference between fixed expenses and variable expenses. Mm -hmm. Fixed expenses are the things you have to pay for no matter what. A lot of that can't be put on credit cards. It um, things like I can't put my mortgage on a credit card. Um, things that are health insurance uh, premiums. So, you know, those are some big big numbers for a lot of people. Those are fixed expenses. Variable expenses are the things that change week to week or month to month. Um, that is typically where people are using credit cards, mm-hmm. and yep. where you get into spending trouble is either have too high of fixed expenses, so you take on too much debt or things you can't afford, which is a one-time decision, or it's the every decision that happens, you know, every every single day using credit cards. And so there needs to be an understanding, maybe it's weekly, maybe it's monthly, of how much can you afford to spend total for variable expenses. And that's basically how much can I spend on a credit card. And as long as 
someone is keeping track of that. They're looking at their credit card statement to see what they've spent. Um, they have a general idea. Maybe they're using a budgeting app. Then credit cards are great and they can be used effectively. If someone's not willing to put in that work, they shouldn't have a credit card, mm-hmm. period. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not going to take the steps um, to be responsible with a credit card, then you're not able to have a credit card and that's okay. Um So there's a lot there. There's a spectrum. It's not good or bad. Credit cards are just a tool, just like money. Money is just a tool and it can be used really positively or really negatively. And you just need to know kind of where you fit in there. I could tell you some stories that would probably infuriate you from some of my sales and marketing training. So I went through a sales training where, you know, you're, you're offering consulting. What I was doing was there's well, you're on the consult and then you talk about like, you know, what's going on? Like, can I help you? And you get to the end of the, you know, the call where it's like, okay, here is the the package I can off you, offer you. Like, here's the investment and all of that. You know, I'm a therapist. I don't have formal or didn't have formal sales training at the time. And I signed up for this program. And some of the things that they they teach you, like overcoming objections with Um, you know, why people can't pay for it, which, you know, sometimes people do can really afford it. And they're just, you know, kind of getting stuck. But some of the things that I was told I needed to do were just straight up shady, predatory, like encourage people to sign up for those 18 month no interest credit cards. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people like if you already have credit card debt, you might not um, be able to qualify for one of those or some of those options, they have this insane interest rate. To me, that's just sending you down this path of poor decisions. If you're, you don't have the money, you don't know how you're going to pay for it. And you're taking out the loan that where you have no plan for how am I going to make the money to pay this off? And I was like, what is this really happening? You're really recommending that I'm, I do this and saying that I'm helping people like, you know, again, like people don't always know how to support their kids with money. They don't always know how to make good decisions. Well, when there's people telling, giving people advice like that. Right. <laughs> but that, And that's a great, uh, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, it's unfortunate that I'm not surprised at all that you said that, <laughs> but that's a great example to talk to your kids about it. Yeah. But you, you know, if you sign up for something like that or you didn't, but you got exposed to it, that's a great time to say, this is the type of marketing you're going to get. This is the type of sales pitch you're going to get. And here's how I felt when I, when I saw that my immediate reaction was, Oh, that's great. I don't have to pay for this right now. But then I thought about it and, and walk them through your thought process. Why did you not sign up for it? If, if you got pitched the same thing, Uh, or if you happen to buy it and you say, I really made a mistake. You don't have to tell them the dollar amount. Yeah. Admit that you made a mistake so they can learn from it. That's mm-hmm. much better uh, on that front. But um, I think credit cards can be great in the right setting. Mm-hmm. But if there's ever a risk of going into credit card debt, you shouldn't use credit cards. Well, and I think that what people, so there's the wants and needs, and then there's the idea of the credit limit and what sometimes the companies will do is they'll keep giving you more. And it's like, right. Like that's not money you have, you know, like people are spending money that they don't have just because, and, and again, I, I'm not saying this to shame people. Like there's, if you are overwhelmed and you're kind of having a hard time seeing the whole big picture, There's like, it's almost like social media where you know that you shouldn't be scrolling social media and, you know, look, clicking on this and that or whatever, but you're in there and it's intentionally addictive. And I think some of those things are, it's like intentionally meant to trick your brain into making a poor decision. Even if you're an adult, like good cognitive skills, you can get into a situation where you are making an emotional decision based on whatever. Um, And yeah, I mean, I think that that's important when, you know, as we're kind of shifting over to the, the adult professional side, when you're trying to invest in support, because a lot of times for me, this is when I was wanting to start my business. I was, you know, going from being a therapist, I'm trying to help people. I want to start a business that's done ethically. And I'm trying to navigate all these different 
things about you know, again, a lot of people who are, they're a therapist and they're not used to charging people for their mm -hmm. services. And that's a whole thing. And like, I mean, I just, yeah. I mean, I, I think that that is, it can be very hard to navigate for people. So. Thank you so much for listening. This is the point of the conversation where we shifted to talking about how you can improve your financial literacy to plan a career and a life that allows you to do fulfilling work, that helps you to make an impact, but do it responsibly, especially if you're someone who really just decided to do your job because you wanted to help people and you never really envisioned yourself thinking about the financial side of things. So be sure to listen to episode 146, where Ben and I talk about the six stages of financial independence. And we also talk about some specific examples of how this might apply to you if you are a therapist, teacher, or working in K-12 education or healthcare in some way. Because this is the halfway point of the conversation, we didn't get to the point where Ben shared where you can connect with him, but you can connect with him on LinkedIn, as well as dollarsandkids.com and at his Illuminate Wealth Management website. So be sure to check the show notes for all of the links for where you can connect with him. And if you want to learn more about the School of Clinical Leadership, my program that helps related service providers design services that support executive functioning in K-12 kids, you can go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash clinical leadership. If you have a suggestion for a guest or if you would like to be a guest, please email me at talktome at drkarenspeech.com. And if you found this episode useful, please leave me a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time.